And today on Show is India, it is indeed once again my pleasure to welcome Azita Ganazada here on Show is India. And you're in Los Angeles right now. And Azita, of course, I saw you a few times during your Broadway play, Kite Runner. I'm such a fan. You did such an amazing job. Thank you so much. It was such an honor and a privilege to work with the actors we had on the stage and to work with the script and to work with Khaled's words and Matthew Spangler and and just to be at the Helen Hayes Theater. I mean, what a dream. I can just imagine. So as you said today, as I had mentioned to you, we're actually working with the California State Library and we're very privileged as Showbiz India has a grant to promote awareness of hate violence and stop the hate against all Asians and all ethnicities. So it really is a privilege to be doing this. And your story is so, so incredible on so many, many levels. I'll start from the beginning. You are a refugee from Afghanistan. You came when you were a very little girl. So just tell me that part of the story, if you wouldn't mind. You know, it's so interesting. Afghanistan is always in the news, it seems like my entire life, um, in the space of like, you know, refugees, occupation, war, uh, Taliban, uh, the removal of women's rights. And my dad and mom, I think my dad more so at the time, he had worked for the United States government. And he just knew that the invasion of the Soviets into Afghanistan would create so much instability and wanted a better life for his girls. He had two daughters at the time. Um, and just, I think, wanted a better life for himself somewhere where you know, he could be safe, feel safe, where his life wasn't threatened. Um, so we arrived to Washington, D.C. and just you know, had a really interesting acclimation to um, the arrivals. It's so different now. I work with a lot of the new arrivals, but when we came, there was no help. There was no person. We were, you know, there's such no community. Um, we really showed up to an all, you know, incredibly loving, not all of it, I'd say 75% of it, a loving white Christian community in Northern Virginia. And speaking of when you were growing up, you were a victim of hate slander and kids. Mm -hmm. Describe what that was like and what did that make you feel like? Well, it's so interesting. I didn't know it was hate slander. I just thought it was my existence. I didn't know that until much later when I got older because we were in such a heavily populated, um, you know, all white community that I just thought we were deserving of that otherness, right? Like we didn't fit in, you know, we were told to go back to our country. They threw rocks at us. My older sister took it a lot harder. I think I was a little bit protected both from her trying to protect me from it, but also from being really young. Um, but, you know, they would they would always ask me if I smelled a certain way or like do this with the eyebrow and then say, go back to your country. and. And I just, you know, I never ever grew up thoughting I was even remotely um, uh, pretty, you know, like not that that matters, but I think as little girls, you think, oh, I, am I, you know, whatever. I just thought I was hideous. <laughs> well, you were definitely very, very wrong. And these kids can be very cruel, but this is obviously passed on to them. Yeah, but also, you know, I would say that that would happen as an adult sometimes. You know, I remember after 9-11, you know, as a joke, friends would say, check her shoes, um, you know, because of the TSA change. And and I, I was kind of shocked. And even in like relationships with like men, sometimes they would like make like a joke about curry or something random, which isn't even Afghanistan. <laughs> and, you know, it was it, it it wasn't just as a child, you know, it just it kind of went on. But even in my intimate kind of friend groups, there were these kind of undercutting jokes to kind of put me in my place a little bit. I don't think that that ended. So I don't know that it was just kids. Yeah, and I don't think it has ended even today. Therefore, you know, like I said, we work with the California State Library to raise awareness of this very same thing. Actually, I was traveling through Texas and for the first time I was like at, um, South, no, Austin Film Festival. And I just remember the man checking my license just took such a such a hard glance at my name. And it, and it was really, it was really uncomfortable. And I was like, oh, this is, again, this is 2016, 17. Why am I in this position? Um, so, you know, those things, it definitely trickles down from the messaging, the media messaging that we get 
And people want to otherize and blame because they're living out of fear, a fear basis. You know, immigrants are coming to take our job or immigrants are bringing these things here that we don't know. Uh, and, you know, it's it's awful that that even happens because we're all a, a part of the fabric of the, these communities that we all build together. None of us grew up with uh, role models on TV. You talk about how TV was such a big part of your growing up, but we didn't ever see anyone looking like us. No, I mean, I remember just thinking Alyssa Milano was the closest thing on earth to like a, a brown person. And I think I just became obsessed with everything blonde and preppy and and like middle class or rich. And, you know, we had the Cosby show. I felt like I felt like I could identify with black television and like black movies. Like I remember Blazing Saddles had such an imprint on my life because they like tackled racism. And I was so little watching that movie on UPN with commercials and just seeing the way that they Mel Brooks handled that. Most people learn about other cultures um, and you know, immigrants through television, which is why it's so incredibly important to not always show the stereotype on TV of like a, you know, a Latin gangbanger or, um, you know, a, a, a Middle Eastern terrorist or a South Asian terrorist, because all it does is, is it just heightens that stereotype that people hold on to when anything negative happens in the media. So I do think that, you know, media reinforces negative perceptions of people and it really takes people like yourself and myself that kind of forge these paths for people like us in the media, in television, on television, in the news and whatnot to really change perceptions and be out there educating people, even though we don't want to. Sometimes we just want to be, you know, doing the news. I remember doing the Kite Runner I was doing the kite runner and, you know, I loved doing these interviews with, you know, Farhan and Amir and Amir is, is American primarily. And, you know, everyone gets to talk about acting and all these things, but then they turn to me and they're like, so how do we solve the refugee crisis? <laughs> you know, I have ideas, but also I don't, I, you have to be so many things just to exist. And there's so much pressure on you to be all of the things and perfect and dutiful and informed and educate. You can't be messy and complicated and human and talk about fashion or, you know, talk about food or your favorite restaurants or those things like that, because there's an added pressure for us to educate everybody on everything about this one little community that nobody knows anything about. And I think it's it's quite unfair. You know, when we talk about belonging, if you have to check other or white, then where do you belong? And I know that South Asian is in, is in the Asian community. However, there's such a different set of circumstances between say the Far East Asian cultures and the more central West and South Asian cultures. So that divide wasn't really occurring to people visually. They don't really see you or see me and think, oh, Asian, check a box. You know, they think, oh, well, there's no box for this person let me check white or let me put them in the other box and then you don't get any of the benefits. So it was kind of shocking. I mean, I think I worked really, really hard and I was on such an upswing in my career. And I, I honestly did have to take a couple years to figure out a way to solve this problem. And it wasn't just for me, it was for everybody because it doesn't, it, it affected me, but I saw that there was such a gap, um, such a gaping hole in the hiring practices in the industry that were just forcing us more into these stereotypical roles. And there was an emergency for our communities and for our cultures. So we had to, as artists, step up and change it for ourselves. And kudos to you, you did. Yeah, that, it was the first time. Now it's been 43 years, but at the time it was 37 years. It was the first time a new um, hiring category had been added into a labor contract in in Hollywood, I mean, really, I think in the United States in, at this level. So it was quite an accomplishment. I really think that that's one, my my immigrant tendencies to, you know, <laughs> be the best and, yeah, and to not take no for an answer and to find a way through things, but also my political upbringing, which taught me how to really be in rooms and understand how to communicate with people and to help them see our perspective. I don't think there's space to always, I think, 
I think we can be angry, but I think we take that anger and we turn it into action. And I think that's how you actually create change. I'm so, so proud of you as a South Asian woman. Kudos, you're beautiful inside out and you have purpose. But now I'm gonna make it light for one second. Okay. So what are you up to in your career? What can we see more of? Well, I came back from doing the play and we did some really exciting events for my nonprofit, Mean Arts Advocacy Coalition. And then I shot a film um, with Billy Gardell, who's the lead of Mike and Molly and um, Bob Hart's Abishola. And I'm off to um, Egypt to shoot a very special episode of Quantum Leap. Just diving back into a little television and film. Thank you so much for giving your time. I know you've been very busy this whole trip, but you made it happen. And I know your words mean a lot to a lot of people. Well, I'm so grateful for you and for this platform and to everybody's Showbiz India for continuing to uplift our voices. Oh, thank you, Azita.